morning, Frontline. Good morning. Go ahead, stand up. We are going to jump right into worship and just invite the Holy Spirit's presence here to be with us as we worship our amazing God, our amazing King, our amazing Savior. Let's just welcome him in this morning. Sing Spirit of the Living God. Spirit of the Living God, Spirit of the Living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word. Spirit of the Living God, Spirit of the Living God, we want to know you more and more. We're hanging on every word.
to be worshiping in the presence of the Holy Spirit this morning. Amen. So as we continue to worship today, let us remember that God sent us the Holy Spirit to enter our hearts, to guide our thoughts, and to influence our actions. So as we continue to worship, we love to read this prayer from St. Augustine aloud together. So will you read this with us? Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Speaking words of 
He is holy. He is worthy. Sometimes I just, I feel like we miss that. join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are worthy. I stand in awe of you. The fact that you would call me a sinner to yourself and that you would die on the cross for me. I thank you, Lord, for who you are. Lord, I ask that your presence would just hover in this place right now and you would invade those of us in here, Lord, who need to know you more. I pray, Lord, for each person here, Lord, that they would come into an intimate knowledge of a loving Savior and Father that you are. Lord, we carry into here so many things. We walk through these doors with physical problems. We walk through these doors with emotional problems. We walk through these doors with spiritual problems. And Lord, we just want to lay them at your feet right now. And ask that you, Lord, would carry that burden for each one of us. Lord, we know you care more intimately and deeply for us than we will ever care for ourselves. And these situations have to go through your hands first before they ever come to us. And Lord, you won't give us more than we can bear. We know that. We trust in your word. We ask, Lord, through this time together this morning, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified, that your name would be lifted high, and that our praises would be for you and you alone, for you are God. And I pray this in your name and all God's people said, amen. And wow, go ahead and have a seat this morning. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, worship team. Man, that was powerful. Thank you. Uh, wow, welcome to Frontline Church. Uh, welcome to uh, here, whether you are in person here or you happen to be joining us online. Man, we're just so glad that you are part of the community here. Uh, my name is Blake. I happen to be uh, one of the pastors here at Frontline. Just good, uh, good to be here this morning. Welcome to October, uh, man, first Sunday in October, the month where we get to uh, dress in funny costumes and uh, get candy and stuff. And we also get to celebrate Halloween too. So uh, those two things happen this time. So thankful that you're here this morning. I was going through some Halloween uh, things with my grandson uh, just the other day. And uh, he was trying to decide what he wanted to be for Halloween, and I was going over the usual things, and he said, hey, what were you back in the day when you were, in, uh, when you were a kid? And so I said, you know what, I wanted, to be, I wanted to be a superhero when I was a kid. 
And so, uh, I, you know, the typical Superman, the typical Batman, the typical uh, Spider-Man, anything like that. No, not for me. I wanted to be underdog. If you can pull that up. Anybody remember underdog? Oh, man. Saturday morning cartoons, Hong Kong Fooey, right? Anybody else there? Oh, now we're getting back into my time here. I wanted, man, I go to Meyer, pick out that cheap costume with that little uh, mask, you know, that had that tight rope on there where you, uh, you know, you couldn't see out of the things and had no peripheral vision. So it was awesome for trick-or-treating that night with cars going by and you couldn't see anything. It was great. But... Anyway, uh, hey, I was looking at that, and I said, you know what, Underdog, why I liked him so much, because Underdog was just this uh, just unassuming kid. His name was uh, Shushine Billy, and uh, Shushine Billy, uh, when he saw somebody in need or he saw somebody in distress, he went into a phone booth, and then all of a sudden, the phone booth exploded, and he turned into Underdog. He had his cape on, and he helped people in distress. And so this morning, I thought, you know what? All of us this morning get to be underdogs this morning. So on your seat when you came in, uh, you see this little card here, this little essentials card. This is a shopping list. For those of you who don't know our essentials store, uh, it's over on the far side of our building, over here where I am right now, way over there. Uh, and we get to help people in need in our community. Families, uh, individuals, moms, uh, kids in our community that need the essential items. Now they can get food, they can get clothing, stuff like that, but what they can't get is essential items. And so we provide those at little to no cost over there. Uh, and it's our opportunity this month to help partner with our essential store and fill that up. So when you came in this morning, maybe you saw those big bins out there. Man, how awesome would it be if we could fill those up this week? I got a feeling many of you are going to go shopping this week at Meyer, Target, Walmart, somewhere in there. Uh, why don't you put on your cape this week, okay, and go ahead and check off some of those things and then bring them back to the church here so we can bless a number of families uh, in our community. And that would be awesome. When I think about that, that's actually how the church is supposed to operate. So uh, there's a verse, and it comes from Acts here, and it says this. It says, all the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerful at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. Wouldn't that be awesome to be a church where there is no needy persons among them? We can be that church. We have the opportunity to do that. And so when you give to the essential store, when you give to Frontline Church, we can have that opportunity. So I just want to say thank you uh, for all of you who give faithfully and give sacrificially to the church here. Um, man, we just are in a season right now where we're just a little bit behind. So there's a screen that's coming up on here, and you're going to see, and I just want to point out something on there. Uh, you're going to see that red number on there. But it hasn't been there in a while. Uh, that hasn't, that's been... Uh, uh, coming, uh, our fiscal year starts in June, and uh, we're running a deficit. And that's one of, the, one of the first times that since I've been here where we've run behind. And so I just want to point that out to you. And I just want to ask you, where are you in your giving? Uh, yesterday was college football. I watched a lot of college football. And we have the first quarter, the second quarter, and the third quarter. And we all know all the games usually typically come down to the fourth quarter. Today, my friends, today is October, November, December. We're in the fourth quarter. And so it's time for us to get busy. And so I just want to be honest with you. I took a look at my giving. Uh, our giving, or our income changed this past year, and my giving has lacked a little bit. And so I took an introspective yesterday and going like, where are we? And I just realized we were behind a little bit. So we're going to make that up, and we're going to get sit busy. I'm going to ask you, if you take a look at your giving and where you are this, week, or this year, and maybe it's time, it's fourth quarter, it's time to get busy. So if you would pray with me, Brian's going to come up, and we're going to continue our series about making space. So uh, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for just powerful worship where we can just worship you and we can uh, be able to just lay down our burdens and just say you are holy, you are God. We ask, Lord, that uh, you would find our worship pleasing, that it would put a smile on your face. And right now, Lord, I say as we start to give back to you, I pray, Lord, that you would find us generous. I pray, Lord, that you find us sacrificial. And Lord, I pray that all of these gifts would honor you and glorify your name. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Great to be back with you again. And it's fun to be in the same building as Blake as well. Blake and I were talking about how like we've hardly been together on a Sunday morning at the same church within our Zero Collective uh, network. All, you know, a lot of times we're kind of at different churches on, on Sunday mornings, so it's kind of fun to be back home again. And um, after listening to Blake, any of you Gen Z or millennials, if you need to ask uh, an Xer or a Boomer afterward what, who Underdog is and what a phone booth is, we totally understand. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, they're, they're, we, can, we will make space for you to do that. See what I did there? Um, so we've been in this series for the last month, if you've been with us, you know, called Make Space where we have been talking about, about the story of the tabernacle. And so maybe you're uh, newer with us or just coming in the last couple of weeks, you've been wondering uh, why is this giant tabernacle kind of in the room and why are we in the round? We literally uh, rearranged the room to try to kind of immerse ourselves in the story, in the text of what we've been studying through. And so we've been talking about how God's people began to seek him again in the Exodus story, in the wilderness, through the tabernacle. Not just the leaders, not just those who would be like the heads of the tribes, but all of God's people began to seek him as one people. And the, the story of the tabernacle is where we find that. So we've been talking about where does that story, the story of the tabernacle, intersect our story today? Um, so I, I want to just kind of take you on a little bit of a, a journey. Um, when, I, when my kids were younger, my four boys, if I really, really wanted to punish myself, I would take all four of them fishing with me. <laughs> now, I say that because I love fishing. I really enjoy it. And, and those of you who have taken young children fishing know that actually you don't fish at all when you take your kids fishing. What you do is they fish or they try to fish while you spend all your time trying to untangle their lines, right? That's what you do. So I have this memory, uh, my, my kids are quite a bit younger, I took my older three boys fishing to a pond, not far from here, not far from where we are right now at Frontline, and I took them there because there was lots of bluegill, bluegill are easy fish to catch if you're a kid, and so um, I, I took three of my children, but I only took two fishing rods, and the reason was I didn't think I could handle all three of them fishing at the same time, and so uh, three fi or two fishing rods, so that meant one of them was always going to be sitting on the bank kind of waiting their turn. So um, my, old, my son Andrew, who just turned 20 years old yesterday, but at this, uh, this time he was probably about seven years old, he's sitting on the bank waiting his turn while I'm trying to deal with his other two brothers. And all of a sudden I hear his voice behind me. He says, hey dad, you know, don't even worry about it. I'm fine. I'm just going to catch this fish with my bare hand. And I turn around and I look at him and he is literally like crouched over the edge of the bank with his hand up like this. And what he's looking at is uh, he's looking at this bluegill, which is sitting kind of right on the bed. It looks like this. For those of you who don't know, bluegill will make their kind of these sandy, circular, shallow beds right there. And oftentimes the female will just kind of sit right there on top of the bed, just sort of sitting there fanning the bed. And so he's literally looking at this fish and he's got his hand up. And I looked at him and I, I just kind of rolled my eyes. I was like, okay, whatever. I went back to taking care of his brothers. I didn't even say anything because I knew that fishing is more sophisticated than that, <laughs> right? I mean, th there is equipment that you need in order to fish. There are lures that you perfectly and carefully select. And I've discovered that some lures are made to catch fish, others are made to catch fishermen, and I've bought both kinds. <laughs> There is hours spent perfecting a cast, learning how to put your line right in the water, right where you want it to be. There's a way you do this. And so I'm sitting there working with my other two boys, and I hear a splash behind me. I turn around and look, and Andrew is standing there with a fish in his hand. It's wiggling. He goes, look, Dad, I caught the fish. <laughs> I was shocked. Never before or since have I ever seen anyone plunge their hand in the water and just grab a fish out of the water and hold it there like that. You know who was not shocked in that moment? Andrew. He fully expected. His expectations were, when I put my hand in that water, I'm going to catch that fish. That's what he expected was going to happen. He never doubted it for a second. Now, why didn't I think to try that? Why in all my years fishing have I never thought to try just sticking my hand in, in, in the water and catching a fish? You know why? Because... That's not how you fish. That's not how you fish. Have you ever thought how many things in our spiritual life, I wonder, could we apply that line to? 
Why, why don't you ask God to heal you? Like heal you of that sickness, of, of that addiction. Why don't you ask God to forgive you of that thing that you're carrying around? Uh, why don't you ask God to provide for you supernaturally right now? You know your need. Why don't you? Because that's not how you pray, right? That's not how you pray. That's not how you solve problems in your life. Or, you know, maybe some of you are feeling led right now. Maybe you, you know, even uh, just in this season we've been in, you feel prompted to just be radically generous, just to meet someone else's need in, in an extremely generous way, an extremely generous gift. Why haven't you done it? Because that's not how you manage your money responsibly. Uh, you know, maybe God's calling you to forgive someone. Just radically offer forgiveness to somebody who doesn't deserve it, who's hurt you, who's wounded you. And God's calling you not only to forgive them, but to reach out to them and be the first to, to try to bring reconciliation to the brokenness between you. Why haven't you done it? Because that's not how you right or wrong. That's not how you bring justice to a situation. Maybe there's some of you who can remember what, who Underdog is, and God's calling you to serve the next generation. It's calling you to get involved in uh, the block and our kids' ministry. It's calling you to get involved in uh, NowGen with Pastor Mariah and serving, being a, a small group leader for smelly, stinky middle schoolers. Why haven't you done it? Because that's not what retired people do. Right? How, how many of you, do, you, do, you, do any of the rest of you have some because that's not how yous in your life, I'd, like me? Yeah. What we're going to look at today in the next few minutes in the story of the tabernacle is, is we're going to look at the story of how God led his people. That's the question we're asking. We're asking, go ahead, if you will, to that next one. How does God lead his people? That's what we're looking at today. So we've talked about who is the tabernacle made for. We've talked about why a tabernacle, why not some other thing that God had called them to build. We've talked about how it got made. We've talked about what it was in the tabernacle and how it all pointed to Christ. Today we're talking about how did God actually lead his people through the tabernacle. So uh, if you want to join me, um, we're in Exodus chapter 40. And it, it, the, the passage will be up on the screen as well if you don't have your Bible with you or available. So uh, right now, Exodus 40 is the moment where the tabernacle has been constructed. All the work is done. They did exactly what God called them to do. They have now built this tabernacle, but the tabernacle is not yet the tabernacle. It's missing something. Then Exodus 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting... And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. I love this because uh, this is the moment the, the presence of God fills the tabernacle. So they did all the work, they prepared it, but something is missing. The tabernacle is not the tabernacle until the presence of God fills it. Until the presence of God filled the tabernacle, the tabernacle was just a tent. And I would submit to you today that this church, without the presence of God, this church is just a building. That's all it is. We need the presence of God today leading us, guiding us, directing us in our lives. And so Israel, the basic way that they functioned in the wilderness, their mindset was, well, when, when, if God goes, then we go. So they watched and the cloud would descend over the tabernacle. And as long as the cloud was there, that's where they would be. But when the cloud moved, that's when they would move it. Where he goes, we go. That was their mantra. Their expectations were as a people, they believed, they fully expected that God was going to, to move, that he was going to lead them, that he was going to every single day move and work. So, so they didn't go, okay, God, we're going to go over here. This is the direction we're going. Will you just bless this direction? Will you just get on board? This is, where I'm, this is where I'm going, God. This is where we're going. Help us out. Bless my plans. Get on board with my direction. That's not how they operated. They paused. They waited. They fixed their gaze 
on the cloud. And when the cloud moved, then they moved. They said, God, we're paying attention. We're listening. We're discerning. We're watching you. And when you move, then we'll get on board with the direction you're going. So two very different ways to live your life, aren't they? God, get on board with me. Here's where I'm going. Bless my direction. Versus I'm pausing, I'm waiting, I'm inviting, I'm listening. And when you move, I'm going to get on board with where you're going. What if we expected God to lead us like that today? What, what if we woke up every single day with the expectation that God was going to lead us in our day? That he was going to guide us? That he, he was actually going to show us where to go and show us how to live our lives and what to do. What, what if we believed that every, what if we flipped the script and every single day, whatever challenge we faced, whatever difficulty we ran into, instead of looking at it as a, a problem, what if we looked at it as an opportunity to be led by God? See, we believe this lie that our wounds, our brokenness, our challenges, our problems, those things are interfering with God's plan for our lives, right? That's what we think. Like whenever I, I hit a, a roadblock, whenever I hit a challenge, well, that thing is actually interfering. It's getting in the way of, of God's plan for my life. So I have to kind of get that out of the way so I can go connect with him. And I, and I would tell you today that, that actually those things are the very site. They're the very place where God wants to enter in by his presence and he wants to lead you. I've been thinking about this uh, quite a bit actually recently in my life about how oftentimes whenever I face anything, any kind of hardship, any kind of struggle or challenge, whether it be here at the church or, or uh, in, in my personal life, whatever it is, I've been thinking about how I, my default automatically I think to myself, this uh, problem, this challenge is creating the problems I have in my life. And what I'm learning is that actually oftentimes the challenges, the struggles, the weaknesses in my life, those are the places that are just exposing where I need God to lead me. They're just the places, the sites of my life where God's trying to expose, hey, you need me in this. You need me right here. So uh, oftentimes I'll example... Um, I have these periods of time where I'll get on social media and I'll be on social media and I'll be active and then I will get off social media and like I can't be on social media anymore. It's horrible. And what will happen is uh, I'm getting on social media and I'm looking and I will find some guy about the same age as me that I know and he's got kids the same age as my kids and he's got a job and he's busy and he works, but he is shredded. <laughs> and I will look and I'm just like, how can somebody, how can that happen? And so I'll get all insecure or I'll get envious or whatever. And then I will decide, you know what? Social media is causing my problems. It's causing all these problems of insecurity in my life. But and then I will get off uh, Facebook for a little while or, or Instagram or whatever it is for a bit. But what if, what, what if social media isn't actually creating my problems? What if social media is just exposing the insecurity that's always been there, right? The envy that's always been there. I was talking to someone this past week having struggles in their marriage, and they are convinced, this person is convinced, my bad marriage has caused all my problems. This is my spouse's fault. I had no problems before I got married, and so they're, they're in their mind, they are convinced, my bad marriage caused all my problems. Your bad marriage didn't cause your problems. Your, your bad marriage is simply exposing your real problem, that you are a selfish sinner, just like me, just like all the rest of us. And you need God. On a more uh, personal even note, uh, every six months, I go through this kind of journey with fear. I, I go through uh, uh, full body CT scans every six months uh, to determine whether or not I'm still in remission. And so I just went through another round of that and, and praise God, I mean, it was good news. I, I am still in remission. I'm thanking God for that. But yeah. <laughs> And I, I, you know, I don't talk about it to the people who are close to me very much. I don't share about it a lot when I'm going through that. But every time it's like this journey with fear, fear comes up in my life. And so the question is, did, did a, a cancer diagnosis, did it create fear in my life? Or really, is it just that a cancer diagnosis is exposing the fear that's always been there underneath everything in my life? I need 
God in those places. The, the longer you follow Christ, the more you realize the struggles, the brokenness, the wounds, the challenges, the problems that you face, they didn't create your situation. They are exposing the very places where you need God to lead you. Those are the places where you need to invite him in. And oftentimes we don't. We say, I got to get that out of the way. That's interfering with me being a good person or me being, you know, doing all the things I should be doing. God doesn't want us to, he wants us simply to look at those places in our life and say, oh, Jesus, we need you. We need you. The question I want to ask you as you reflect today is, where is he exposing your need to be led by him? Where is God exposing that you have a need to be led by him? Here's a hint. It's probably a place of, a place of pain. It's a place of uncertainty. It's a place of fear, anxiety, worry. It's a place of anger, blame, unforgiveness. What he's doing is he's exposing, he's bringing it to your attention, he's helping you see, this is a place in your life where you need me. You need, you need me to lead you because you don't have what it takes in your own power. This is the way the Israelites operated in the wilderness. God, we don't move until we see you move. We need you to lead us. Now, there's no cloud today. I know what some of you are thinking, well, that's awesome. You know, we don't have like a cloud that lifts today, and it's, it's not that easy, right? Today, well, we, that's true. We do not have a cloud today, but we have a wind. That's what we have, the Holy Spirit. And actually, a, a dynamic relationship with the Holy Spirit is something that Jesus wanted for us. He desperately wanted us to experience that as his followers. So this is uh, John chapter 14. On the last night that Jesus was, was with his disciples before he was betrayed and went to the cross, he makes them a promise. This is what he says, verse 15. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and does not recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now. So he's talking about himself. He lives with you now and later he will be in you. Now, uh, what's interesting in the original language there is uh, where Jesus says, I, I will ask the Father and he will send another advocate. Like in our English language, we get kind of an idea in our head, well, it's a different person and another advocate means, but an the word another there actually in the original language meant another one the same as me. Not another one different than me. Jesus is literally saying the same, the same uh, God who is with you right now will be in you by the power of the Holy Spirit Another advocate the same as me. This is what Jesus wanted for his disciples. So if you know Jesus, you know the Holy Spirit already. If you've come to a place in your life where you've entrusted your life to, to Jesus, where you've repented and you've said, God, I can't run my life in my own power. It's nothing but, but brokenness and it's nothing but sin. I surrender my life to you. I invite you to be Lord of my life. If you've come to that place in your life, you already know the Holy Spirit He's already actively at work in your life. He's already actively speaking to you. You already know him. But maybe you're not experiencing him every single day. What's interesting is that Jesus, in the very beginning of the book of Acts, he says to his disciples, he says, what I want you to do is I want you to go into an upper room and I want you to wait. He literally says, like, you do not have yet what you need to start the church. Do not try to start the church yet in your own power. That's what he tells them to do. I, I find it amazing that Jesus says, like, until you have the Holy Spirit, you don't have what you need to start the church. The disciples who had been with Jesus day in, day out for three years did not have what they needed still to start the church. They, they'd seen Jesus raised from the grave. They'd spent 40 days with the resurrected Christ. They still did not have what they needed to start the church. Jesus is like, whatever you do, go in the upper room and wait. Just stop. The only decision they made while they were in the upper room was who was going to replace Judas as the next disciple. And they, they decided that by casting lots, <laughs> which is the way of the world. And then, you know, many of you, you know the beautiful story in Acts chapter 2 is the moment they're in the upper room and the Holy Spirit arrives on the day of Pentecost. And the disciples and then many others begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And really, the rest of the book of Acts, if you've read the book of Acts, the, the entire rest of that uh, entire book of the Bible, really the main character is the Holy Spirit. It's just about how the Holy Spirit just kept leading the church and leading the disciples and leading people. And, and again, I would submit to you today, that's what Jesus wanted for us. That's what he still wants for us. It's what we're still called to today. He wanted for us to have this dynamic, active relationship with the Holy Spirit where we're, le we're being led by him, where we're inviting him into the places in our lives where we're struggling, where, where we don't know what to do next, and we're realizing, oh, look, this isn't an opportunity for me to jump in and fix it in my own strength. This is an opportunity for me to step back and say, oh, God, okay, God, you're exposing a place in my life where I need you. Come, Holy Spirit, come and lead me. That's what he wanted us to do. That's the kind of relationship he wanted us to have. Now, maybe you uh, have the Holy Spirit living in you. You have a relationship with Jesus. Go ahead to that next one if you would. But, but the question is, you know, why, aren't, why don't we experience the, the Holy Spirit leading us? Maybe you're wondering right, right now, well, if all this is true, why don't, I, why don't I experience that? Why don't I sense him? And here's what I would tell you is that I, I think the reason is because we do not know how to invite and respond to him today. In fact, in the church, I don't think we, we've given enough time to the Holy Spirit. I don't think we've talked enough or taught enough on who the Holy Spirit is and how he wants to have an active part in our lives and leading us and guiding us. We don't know how to invite him in our lives and we don't know how to respond to him, particularly in the West, in the church today. We, we just don't understand that. I love this moment going back again into the tabernacle and the story of Israel. Before the tabernacle was finished, Moses and God have this powerful conversation where basically Moses is like, okay, God, I know you called me to lead these people, but who are you going to send with me? Moses is recognizing like, I can't lead these people in the wilderness. And so even before the tabernacle is built, Moses is asking God, who are you going to send? Who are you going to send? I love this conversation. Exodus 33, verse, verse 14. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. You're going to rest, Moses. It's not going to be you and your own effort doing it. It's going to be me and my presence leading you. Then Moses said to him, I love this line so much. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Moses literally says back to God, if your presence isn't going to go with me, if, if it isn't going to go with us as a people, don't send me up from here. Do you understand what Moses is saying there? He's saying, I, I don't want a, a messenger. I don't want an angel. I don't want an LED wall. I don't want a, a really great rock and worship band. I don't want a thriving kids ministry. I want your presence. If I don't have your presence, if, I, if you're not with me, God, I'm not moving. He is literally refusing to move until he knows that God is leading him by his presence. That's what he's saying. That's what he's doing. Our chief assignment today is to ask for him and then be willing to receive whatever it is he wants to give us. That's what we're called to be today. That's what we're called to do as his people. To invite him into the places of our lives where we need him, into the places of our lives where we don't know what to do, where, where something is too big for me. And then be willing to follow, be willing to receive Oftentimes, it's more of a gradual dependence on the Holy Spirit that grows over time as we learn to follow him rather than some big explosion. Now, there are the big explosions, the big moments where he moves dramatically and powerfully. But I, I've discovered it. Sometimes it's more of just gradually, little by little, day by day, learning when to just go, whoa, I can't act on my own power right now. I need you, Holy Spirit. And we just ask there is no backstage pass to the Holy Spirit. We, if you know Christ, you have the same access to Jesus. You have the same access to, his, to the Holy Spirit that any of us has. Week one of this series, we talked about how oftentimes we just don't understand the access we have to God. We don't understand the access because of what Christ did for us on the cross. And we are literally called children of God. And we're, when we pursue our Father, He leans in. He wants to be in our lives. We don't understand that a lot of times. We don't act on it. We don't act like we're children. There's no backstage pass. There's no secret access. You have the same access to the Holy Spirit that me or that anybody else has. 
not by your own power, your own strength, but through Christ living in you, through Christ who, who's redeemed you. So why don't we invite him to lead us more often? Why don't we pause and invite him and respond to him more often? It's very, very simple. It's because that's not how you fish. That's why. Because that's not how you pray. That's not how you make decisions. That's not how you do it. That's not how you lead an organization. That's not how you provide for a family. That's not how you make a strategic plan. That's not how you balance a budget. It's not how you do that. Those, that's not how yous destroy our dependence on the Holy Spirit. We just think we have better ideas. If you have come to a place in your life where you've realized you need him, that you don't have better ideas, here's what I would suggest. I, maybe just flipping the script a little bit. Go ahead if you could to that next. Our default oftentimes, I'll just admit, my default a lot of times is I pray and then I do. Right? So if something comes up in my life and I say, I got to need your help. Would you solve this problem? Amen. And then I go and I do something. I take some action because that's what you do. That's how you solve problems. That's how you be responsible, right? What, what if we changed it? What if instead we changed our default to, God, I'm just inviting you, Holy Spirit. I'm inviting you into this place in my life. I'm, I'm inviting you into this place where I don't understand. I'm inviting you into this place where I, I can't forgive this person. I'm inviting you into this place where I don't know what decision to make. I'm inviting you into this space where I don't have answers. And then what if we listened? And I mean listened. Just like my son went with his hand over the water, he fully just expected he was going to catch a fish. What if we actually listened just fully expecting that God is going to do what he says he's going to do, that he's going to lead us, that he's going to speak? What if in faith we actually invited him and then, I mean, either he's God or, or he's not. And we just gave him space. We made space literally for him to speak and to show us. And then when we know we've heard from him, then we do. But we say like Moses, I'm refusing to move forward in my own power. I'm refusing to solve this in my own strength. If you don't go before me, don't send me up from here. I need you. I need you to guide me. Where in your life is he exposing where you need him? I love uh, Watchman Nee, famous spiritual writer. I've shared this with you before. Uh, he fa very famously said, um, Satan's main goal in life is simply to get you to act unaided. We think that like Satan's main goal is to like get us to go way off track and do some horrible, awful sin, commit some horrible crime or do something like that. No, it's not what he's up to. Satan's main goal is just to get you to act in your own power, to act unaided from the Holy Spirit. And he knows you'll do the rest from there. You'll unravel your life on your own from there. You don't need that much help. So would you bow with me? Everybody in this room, if you're watching online, would love for you to participate in this with us as well. I mean, just bow right where you are. And just in the next few moments, let's just bring him our, because that's, that's not how use. <laughs> and let's just invite him to lead in the specific area of your life where he's just revealing right now. I believe probably there's some place in your life where he's wanting to expose and show you, hey, the, the situation you're facing, it didn't create your problems. It's just exposing your need. It's exposing where you need me. And so Jesus, we come to you. We thank you that you went before us, that by your death on the cross and by your resurrection, you paid the price for our sins. You redeemed us. And that when we put our faith and our trust in you, we are children of God. And when we do that, we have access. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. We need you. We need you in our families. We need you in our lives. We need you in our workplaces. We need you in our schools. We need you in our country. We need you, uh, God, in the places uh, that are so broken in our world. 
we don't have the answers, God. We don't have the, our power and our own strength. For too long, we've been trying to do things and fix things in our own power. So we just come to you right now. God, I pray that we would not just talk about who you are and learn about who you are, but that we would experience you leading us. We invite you right now, fully expecting that you are who you say you are and that you are mighty to save, that you are mighty to lead, that you are mighty and able to accomplish even greater, immeasurably more than anything we could ever ask or imagine by your power that is at work within us. So Holy Spirit, come. And to that end, do it. Uh, we will follow you as you lead us. I'm not going to say amen. Just take a moment and just fix your gaze on Jesus. Just invite him and listen to him.
sing this to him. to just close this with a, a word of a benediction. The word just means blessing. If you're not familiar, just if you feel comfortable extending your hands in a posture of reception, I'd love to just speak these words over you as you go today. I'm so grateful you were here with us, whether online or in the room. And I hope you've sensed, even as we've gathered here today, he has been here with us. And he doesn't want to just stop there. And so now, my brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, may you come to him with faith like a child. May you not just pray and then do, may you invite him and with expectation believe that he is going to lead you and may he be your guide. May he be an ever-present help in times of trouble, a strong refuge, and the one who ultimately seals your future. And may you trust in that and respond to him with whatever he asks you to do. And in Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen. Love you guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for service today. If you felt God speak to you, be sure to share this video and subscribe or follow to make sure that you don't miss the next one. Also, don't forget to head over to frontlinegr.com slash new if this was your first time joining us. We hope to see you next time. Thank you.